Let's go to Mark chapter number 11. Mark chapter number 11. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter number 11, verse number 1. This is what we call Palm Sunday. It is the Sunday before Resurrection Sunday. Palm Sunday is an important aspect of our faith. It is the week before. It is the week of week before Resurrection Sunday. So this is important for you to know because it's a part of you and I's faith that this is a week that is just as important as Resurrection because it is the week that led up to Jesus' uh, triumphal entry and his um, uh, death and burial. Mark chapter number 11. Verse number 1. As they approached Jerusalem, and came to Bethpage at Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say to them, The Lord needs it, and, will, and they will send it back here shortly. They went and found a coat outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as, as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing untying the cult? They answered, as Jesus has told them to, and the people let them go. Uh, when they brought the cult to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches. That's why we call it Palm Sunday, because they threw palm branches down on the road. And those who went ahead, those who followed, shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest and in heaven. Father, breathe life. Let our thoughts, let our minds be congruent to what you desire to say to us and through us today. And we will be better by the word of faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here is an interesting um, passage of scripture that highlights what we're journeying through called Palm Sunday. It's the week where Jesus is, we call it Holy Week, it's the week where Jesus is coming to the realization that in order for me to redeem all of us, I have to embrace what is scary. And so there are times in history, brothers and sisters, where we have a circumstance or a situation in our lives that becomes a game changer. Whether you meet somebody that you've always wanted to meet and, and because you met them, they've changed your life and it's become a game changer. Whether it's a phone call you've been hoping that you would receive and you finally got it and they told you you got the job, it's a game changer. And a lot of times as Christians, we are oftentimes in search of something that will be a game changer in our lives. Uh, such as if you were watching the playoffs yesterday, the, one of the Magic players hit a game winning shot. It was a game changer. It's, it's a game changer. They actually won. It's a game changer. And so there, there are various aspects of game changers. But I want to submit to you today that if you are a believer, you have a name changer. The name changer is a game changer. But here's the thing that I really got to get you to understand is this. We oftentimes are excited about the idea that we have come into the kingdom and have been saved. But that's not where it should stop. Our excitement should be the revelation of the name to us. Now, this may be a little deep for some, but I just want to kind of go there because I think it's important that your victory is going to come not from the information you have of the name, but the revelation that you have of the name. All right. So now when we talk about the revelation, what does the name mean to you? Okay, Jesus. All right. Yeah, we get it. But there's a deeper meaning to the name beyond just the name. 
for you it may be called Yahweh Jesus but for some that word means a lot it means sustainer it means deliverer it means my so what I'm talking about is getting a revelation of the name so that you can have something to hold on to that can be a name changer in your life because here's the reality Knowing about God is not going to always transform the situations that you have in your life. It is going to be the experiences that you've had with God that's going to hold you over when life comes at you in a way that you never anticipated. And here's the danger that these people in this text experience. They were claiming that he is Hosanna, the highest name above the earth. And the reason why they were saying that was because they had an expectation that God was going to do something for them and that's why they said he was who he was. That's problematic because if you only love God for the expectation you have of him, when he doesn't meet your expectation, you're going to cancel him because he didn't meet your expectation. That's where many of us fail in our faith. That's where many of us have a hard time reconciling. I believe that God was going to give me a job. I believe that God was going to make it happen. I believe that God was going to open up the windows of heaven pour me out a blessing that I don't have room enough to contain. I believe that God was going to help me meet the budget. I believe that God was going to make my dreams come to pass. And what do you do when God does not meet your expectation but goes counter contrary to what you express and these individuals were declaring who he was to them but not who he really is. And that's a scary thing because the whole Old Testament it's about a revelation of the name. In Exodus, right? Moses is, is being asked this question that's being played out all throughout the New Testament. Who shall I say men? Who shall I say sent me? And he gives them this word, Yahweh. Okay, now I want them to put it on the screens because that's, that's important. Because the word Yahweh is the word I am that I am. I am that I am. That's the revelation of his name. My name is Yahweh. These people were clearing out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because that's what their information was. They believed that God was going to set up a kingdom and he was going to make this kingdom happen. And that's what their revelation of a God. It wasn't a revelation. It was information that they heard that he's a king. He's going to set up a kingdom. And they thought this is the moment that he's going to set up the kingdom. He ain't going to die. He's going to come overthrow the government, but what they failed to realize was he weren't coming to do that. Not in that season. So now here's the word Yahweh, right? So the word Yahweh in their culture, they would oftentimes leave out the vowel. The reason they would leave out the vowel is because they felt the name was too holy for them to say. So their revelation of the name is we just don't throw the name around when we feel like it. Whenever we approach the name, we approach the name with such reverence and such gratitude and such an indebtedness that we don't just say his name. We're going to drop the vowel off his name. Now, here's a question. How many of you have approached God with that type of reverence? Because your revelation of who he is determines how you deal with him. If you deem that he is holy, and you deem that his name is powerful, then you approach his name with a different type of mentality. If you feel that it's the same as every other name, like Bob, John, then you just throw it out there with no significance. And here's what happens when they would say the name Yahweh. Yahweh is important because they would say this. Yahweh's name means, in essence, as I journey with God, he'll start to show me who he really is. Now that's important because many of us know God in one dimension and knowing a person in one dimension oftentimes limits you into getting to know them in a deeper aspect. So if I know God as a savior, I oftentimes fall in love with that, but then I stop there because I don't process that God is deeper than just the savior. His name has riches and depths to it that even when you think you've discovered who he is, you start to realize you really don't know much about him. You could be walking with God for 15 years, and if you finally get to a place where you feel like, man, I, I feel like I know God, it shows me that you stop growing in God. Because God will consist, why do we go through trials? I'm glad you asked. 
so that you would have a revelation of another name. Okay, it is very difficult for someone to convince you that TKC is not on 1400 North Noel Street. The reason why it's difficult for someone to convince you is because you've been here. So no matter how many different type of theoretic or philosophical ideologies come about, you can't sway me on what I know. You can flip it, you can tell me, well, Google says this, but I have a revelation that I've experienced, that I've come to 1400 North Noel so many times, and I've seen this place standing through rain, through storms, I know it's here. I know it's here. So when they came to Jesus, they said, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm, I'm going to have a cult that's going to be untied. You, it's never been ridden before. I, I'm going to come in on a donkey. I could have came in on a horse, but I'm not going to come in on a horse. I'm going to come in with humility so I can be an example for those that accept me to know that if I come in on a donkey, you shouldn't come in on a horse. Because honestly, some of the most arrogant people you'll ever meet are Christians with nothing. And so Jesus has given us an example. <laughs> He's given us an example that I'm the savior of the world and I don't have eight assistants. I'm the savior of the world and I don't have 14 assistants working for me. I know, it's, I know it's not popular culture because you, you need an assistant to have your phone. You need an assistant to do your makeup. You need an assistant to do your hair. You need an assistant to do your fingernails. You need an assistant to do your feet. You need an assistant to hold your microphone right. You need an assistant to fan you. Right. Here's the thing. Jesus has given us an example. The greatest in his kingdom will not be the one on the horse. The greatest in his kingdom is not the person that everybody thinks is the greatest. It's oftentimes the person that is being overlooked. So now here's where we go. This name is profound because it is what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. Now, here's in the Old Testament how it parallels. You remember the plagues in Exodus? There were 10 different type of plagues, right? 10 plagues in Exodus. Remember? 10 plagues in Exodus. It was 10 different type of plagues. Each plague was a plague on a type of God that had a name in Exodus that they were worshiping. So God would strategically, systemically destroy each God that they reverence because he wanted them to know, if you bring a God in my presence, I'm going to bring him down. Anything that you worship above my name, I'm going to bring it down because I only want my name to be the thing that you reverence and the only thing that you worship. And so what God does is sometimes God's building our lives sequentially. Every season matters because sometimes one season is insignificant to you because you don't have the other season. Okay, so let me say it in a way that makes sense. If I am in God, God doesn't waste any ingredients in my life. Have you ever tried to fix, I'm not a handyman, but have you ever tried to fix something and they give you all these parts and you think, this ain't needed. And you skip like the little washer and you say that ain't needed. And then you go sit down on the chair that you did not put the washer on. And then you realize the chair breaks because you skipped one important part that seemed insignificant, but it was significant to the totality of the project. Well, here it is. God will not waste any season of your life. Every season is significant. Every season is significant. Every ingredient is significant. And every season is a part of you getting to know the fullness of the name of God. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes God will keep people in a season so God can introduce you to that audience and release that person from that place because he wanted to make sure you got introduced before they got displaced. So here's, here's, here's what it is. 
Um, every, every season matters, right? Every season matters, every ingredient matters. So um, in, in May, I'm going to this church in Texas called Gateway Church, one of the largest churches in Texas. It is the largest church in Texas, but here's the interesting thing. I was supposed to go to lunch with the guy that invited me to speak at his church in celebration. And it's because of his invitation that I was introduced to the church at Gateway. Well, he, we were supposed to go to lunch last week. It didn't happen. And then we were supposed to go to lunch this Wednesday. And he had to cancel. And he sent me a message. He said, hey, just want to let you know, I'm no longer a part of the place that I was at. Um, I got released. Nothing immoral. They just wanted to go a, a different direction. And the interesting thing that he said to me was, they just wanted to keep me until the men's conference. And after the men's conference that you spoke at, that was my last assignment. If he would have got released before the men's conference, I would have never got introduced. Sometimes God will keep people in one place so that you can get introduced because if they season expires, then you won't get the introduction that you need. So everything and every season matters in your life. It may not make sense in this season why God allowed you to have or experience this, but it will make sense. Have you ever watched a movie and you didn't get what the movie was about till the end of the movie and you start appreciating the movie because you were like, oh, that's what the movie was about. Here's the reality. Most of us don't recognize that the things that you are enduring today are not meant for you to understand them today, but are meant for them to build you tomorrow. When they were laying down palm branches, even though they did not have a revelation of God's name, the palm branches were very significant. What they were, they could have laid down anything. They could have laid down, they could have laid down juniper trees, they could have laid down all different types of plant trees, but they laid down palm trees. Why? The reason is, is because there's a revelation even in that, that God sometimes can use our ignorance to be a part of his story. How many times have you not recognized that God was using you and you had no clue he was? In our ignorance, God uses us. And they lay down palm branches out of all the trees they could lay down. You do know the reason why they lay down palm branches, in my theological opinion, is this. Palm branches are the only things that don't break during storms. You could have the strongest wind. A palm tree will lean, but it will not break. A palm tree will sway, but it will not break. Because what's the beauty of a palm tree? A palm tree has within it, it has an enzyme that whenever it senses that it's going to be taken over, an enzyme releases an oil into its leaves that allows it to be able to then withstand any amounts of pressure or any amounts of winds that is coming about it. The only reason why the palm tree doesn't break is because it has an oil that runs through it. You see, that's what I'm talking about. Even in our ignorance, there are revelations that God is doing. And there are many reasons why we are not breaking. It is not because we are strong. It is because we have a revelation. The revelation of the name is this. If God has brought me through that, he can bring me through this. But if you haven't had that, then you wouldn't know anything about this. And that's why we have to have a different ideology about, well, why are we suffering? Because God is trying to give us a revelation about his name. And I don't know what you need to know in this season of your life but I can tell you that your prayer will be different if you have a different revelation of his name if you've never been broke you don't know him as a provider but how many of you have been in the place where you didn't have enough money and some odd way God made a way where there seem I mean, you got money that came. I'm not one of those that believe money's coming in the mailbox so don't work. But there was a season of your life you didn't know how you were going to make it. You went to the mailbox and someone gave you the right amount of money. Or someone said, you know what? I've just been thinking about you. I just want to be a blessing to you. And you started to know him now as the Lord my provider. So nobody can take that from you, that the Lord will provide for me. And even if I don't see it right away, I know, I know within myself, I can't be talked out of it. I can't be manipulated out of it. I know that he's able to do that. 
So now, here's the thing. This is a very important statement that you need to know. That even though they had no understanding of who he was, as he's walking through the courts and getting himself ready for his crucifixion, Jesus still had a plan for them. Here's the thing. Dallas Willard says something that's important. We must understand that God does not love us without liking us. Because some of us think that God loves us but doesn't like us. Like God has to love us and like us at the same time. You know how people say, I love you, I just don't like you? You got some family members like, I love you, I just, I just don't like you. I mean, I love you, I do. All my heart, all my soul. I just don't, I don't like you. I don't know what it is. I don't, but, but no, Jesus, Jesus has to love us and like us. But here's the thing. This is another piece I want you to know. I have a great need for Christ, and I have a Christ for my need. I have a great need for Christ, and I have a Christ for my need. Here's Okay, so here's where we pause. God will never let you live in a season where you have no need. Because if I remove the need, then you remove the need for Christ. So every season that God allows me to have a need is God complimenting me to allow me to know that I don't want you to get so comfortable that you don't need me anymore. I'm always going to leave a season where you need me. That's why when they were at the side of the road, they were saying, Lord, we need a Savior. But he wasn't going to save them in the way that they wanted. We all will have needs and God will not meet every single need because if he meets every need, we'll get off our knees. One time. God will not meet every single need because if he meets every single need we'll then get off our knees and there are reasons and seasons that God allows us to withstand certain things because he's trying to give us a revelation of his name and I am convinced in my clothes that you and I will not be able to hold on to God without a personal revelation of who he is to us. Like we can teach you more about him, that ain't gonna help you. Because the same people who knew a lot about Jesus crucified him. But until you have a revelation of his name, you know, so one of my members, this beautiful story, the most encouraging story that I've, that I've seen in my pastorate, probably one of the top ones, that they were believing for a child and they could not have one. And you know, here's the thing. God will let you go to baby showers even though that's your own need. Now you gotta understand this. You know how much faith it is to go to God expecting something and he not make it happen? Do you know how much pain it must take to show up to someone else's baby shower? Let's to show up to someone else's baby shower knowing that you can't have your own. Do you know how much audacity it takes and courage to see everyone bringing gifts to everybody else's baby. And then you have people who are insensitive will say, well, when is your time? What are you waiting for? How come you haven't had one? And then you have to go back into your cave and say, well, you know, we're just waiting. And you got to give the story that death is acceptable. Well, we're just praying that God will, we're not, it's not the right season yet. Or we're just kind of, and then someone else will come and say, well, man, I mean, how long y'all going to wait? And we're going to be old before. And you're, and you're, and you're being, you're being stabbed every Every time, not just at the inability to have a child, but the fact that your prayers feel like they're useless. Then you go to church and they're doing baby dedications. And you got to sit through it. And you got to, you're shedding the tear. And people are like, oh man, they're just so happy for the baby being dedicated. And they don't even realize that you are trying to figure out is God able? And then praise team sing songs like, he's able. And you're singing it, but then you're saying to yourself, I don't know if he's able because my belly's still flat. And then as a husband, you feel less than because 
you can't have this child that you want that and you can't have this child that runs and has your name and has your DNA and has your smile and then you see other people with their sons and daughters and you want that and then all of a sudden I remember one day they were trying all these different things to, to do it and sometimes God does it when we stop thinking about it. I have learned in my revelation that the more I stay up about a certain thing, the more nothing happens. But I have learned the more that I get confidence and say, you know what, I'm going to sleep. Because if, if this is God's, it is his responsibility to make it happen. It is not mine. It is his to make it happen. I'm going to go rest. And in that revelation, I start to know that God is a miracle worker. Now, what's beautiful about this couple is that they were able just to celebrate their own baby shower the other day. Why? Because it's a testimony to them. You cannot tell them that God is not a miracle worker. You cannot tell. So when you say Yahweh to them, they know what it means. They know that, oh, that's the God that will get you pregnant. That's the God that will do the impossible in your life. So my prayer. So here's where it gets scary. In order to know him in a deeper way, you've got to be vulnerable and willing to say, God, I'm willing to allow you to take me through so that I can get to know you. Like, that's not a popular prayer, and I'm not trying to say it is. But the only way you know him in that regard is that he brings you out of something that allows you to testify to it. And I know as a church, that's not a popular message. Like We want to hear like, he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. But I want to let you know that sometimes God won't make a way and he'll let you stay in that season to show you that I can sustain you even in bad seasons. Because he's not just a, he's not a deliverer. He's also a sustainer. A sustainer means that even if I don't enjoy it, I'm being sustained within it. I may not like this job, but I'm being sustained in it. I may not like this, but I'm being sustained in it. He's a sustainer. And a lot of us want God to bring us out because we're falling in love with the God that brings us out. But what about the God that's good enough to keep us in? So my prayer for you all today is this. That God's name would mean something to you. I don't know. I don't know what it means to you today. But it should not mean the same thing five years from now. It should not mean the same thing seven years from now. So here's the thing. When we're teaching you like we need to praise, praise is on a revelation of the name. So when I tell you, you need to thank God, well, it's hard for me to thank God if I ain't got no revelation of God. But it's another thing for me to tell you, thank God, and you remember the God that saved you out of the car accident that you almost got into, and it's easy for you to have a flashback on what God has brought you out of, and therefore praise is a revelation of the name. And so when we say, isn't God a keeper? And you can say, amen, I know he is. Why? Because you've experienced it for yourself. And on the cross, on the cross Jesus sheds his blood so that we can freely experience all of him he is a God that can keep you even in seasons of mental instability I'm not against counselors I'm not against therapists I believe in it I'm certified as a grief counselor but I believe that there are seasons where God can keep you and there are certain seasons that you are not going to be able to get out of just by turning around dancing clapping your hands stomping your feet because if you lose somebody you love you need to learn God as a comforter you need to learn God as a keeper it doesn't stop the tears from falling in your eyes it doesn't stop the sadness it doesn't stop the despair but it does give you a sense of peace.
y'all, it's important, and it's my prayer during these 40 days. My mom called me about this unique story. This young man, he's 33. He has mental health issues, known mental health issues. He lives in the same neighborhood as my mother. Um, he's been to our church on Edgewater Drive. I took him to our church on Edgewater Drive. I knew he had mental challenges, and um, sometimes he, he, he imbalances, and he gets violent, and, and the mom's a strong believer. She's a strong, she's an actual real doctor. She's a strong believer, and her son had an imbalance. She called the police because he's afraid of the police, and the police came, and they were aware that he had a mental challenges. I don't know the story, wasn't there? Um, they tased him to try to calm him, but the tase went to his heart, and he died. I say this story not because I'm trying to push one side or the other. My point of the story is this. You're going to have to know God deeper than just a Sunday morning song. Because when you lose someone that's yours, they may not be perfect, they're yours. And when you lose someone you love and you got to stand over them and bury them in the ground, you need to know God on a deeper level than just, oh, he's a way man. You need to have a revelation that God is a keeper even when life is unfair. Now, God doesn't do everything. Sometimes life is unfair. Scripture is very clear about that, that life is very unfair. It is very, very unfair. It is very unfair. It is very unfair. Life is very unfair. And you may say, God is not fair. Yeah, you're absolutely right. God is not fair. He's just. Because fair is all of us should be dead. But God is just. And you've got to be able to know God even in tragedy. And most of us only know God in triumph. Well, I'm preaching to you to learn God in tragedy. So that when tragedy does happen, because it will. I don't care how saved you are. I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care how powerful you are. Tragedy will come. And you've got to be able to have a relationship with God that is so strong that even though tragedy hurts it doesn't move you from the place of God even though tragedy makes you feel bad it doesn't cause you to walk away from God even though tragedy hurts it doesn't cause you to say God I'm done with you and most of you like my intro are one real tragedy away from walking away from a God you liked but never loved. 